Hello, my name is Regina Schulz. I'm the director of the Römer and Pelizius Museum in Hildesheim and a professor of Egyptology at Munich University. It's a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, I would like to talk to you today about ancient Egyptian creation myths. Ancient Egyptian creation myths are so far interesting because they influenced a lot of different kinds of theoretical ideas and myths also in other cultures. Let's start. Creation. What means creation? And what kind of theories and myths are attempts for explanation on ontological questions such as here we have seven different questions which play a role in ancient Egypt. Of course, you may have some other ideas and some other questions coming from different backgrounds. But if you look to the ancient Egyptians, we really have to be astonished when we learn what kind of abstract questions they were raising. Number one, how did being appear out of non-being? Two. How was the one transformed into the many? Three, how did space and time came into existence? Four, how did gods, men, and kingship came into being? Five, how was the afterlife created? Six, what and who makes the world functioning? And seven, will the creation have an end? So what you can see here is the focus is not only on human beings and how they came into being. The whole concept is much bigger. And it asks what was before the creator and what comes after. If we are looking to the different kinds of explanation models, what we can find is in very different places with different theological school. The concept is still the same. There was at first nothing, and out of the nothing, the creator appeared. How is this? We will learn a little bit later. But in the different places, they have different names and look in a different way. Because in these different theological schools, the basic concept is the same. But the way how to explain it, the stories which were told, can differ. So we have, for example, the god Atum of Heliopolis. But at the same time, Atum and Rearachte could be parts of the same idea of a creator. One is combined with the solar idea. This is Rearachte. And Atum, we will talk later about him, is the first singularity which came out of the nothing. Then we have the god Tach of Memphis who is looking mummified, and you may think at the beginning, this is a god of the afterlife. It's not. It's a world of this life, and it's a creator who played an important role in ancient Egypt. And maybe you all know the god Amun-Ra, who is the most popular of the ancient Egyptian gods, who has different components. For example, also a solar component, and you can see this in the sun disk. Then we come to Hermopolis, and there we find a god with an ibis um, uh, head. This is a god, Toth, sometimes also appeared as a baboon. It's a god of wisdom, and he plays an important role if we ask what was at the very early beginning. Hnum of Elephantine has um, a ram head, and then we also have female creator gods. One of the oldest is Neith of Sars. We know her name from the very earliest period of ancient Egyptian history. And on the other side, we have Isis. Many of you may know her. And Isis is a goddess which is worshipped in many, many places, not only in Egypt, also in the whole Mediterranean. If we look how these creators created the world, then there are very different stories, as I told you. With the god Atum from Heliopolis, it's emanations. Something came out of the god by himself. And sometimes in some texts, it's mentioned that the gods and the human beings are his tears and his sweat. If you look to the solar god Re, then 
the people are talking in ancient Egypt about the first egg and the first bird. If it comes to the god Tach from Memphis, it's his thought and his creative ideas. Magic plays here a special kind of role, which is defined a little bit different than what we understand as magic, and we will talk later about this. Then we come to the god Toth from Hermopolis. He speaks the first word, and this creates a god. The god Chnum is um, creating human beings and gods on a potter's wheel. And the god Amun is just adapting all the different kinds of ideas of other creators. If we come to the female creator goddesses, then we have Nis, and this is a primeval flood, the very first flood, and out of the flood, the first mountain, the first egg was created a step by step. And if we come to Isis, who was worshipped in many, many different places, magic, ritual power, and special secret knowledge plays a role. Let's look to the concept, how the world really was created. What we have is at the very beginning, a situation we can only explain as non-existence. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. And in this nothing, suddenly pattern appeared. And this pattern just describes the situation of the nothing. It describes that there is no light, that there are no ways but it creates suddenly, or there appears suddenly female and male pattern. So we have pairs. And because we have suddenly a kind of formation of pattern, a singularity comes out of it. And the first singularity was Atum. And interesting is his name because it includes the word Tem, which means nothing, but eaten means something. So if we have now these first gods, this first singularity, and it doesn't matter how the name is, because we just saw in different places it can have different names, we can say um, the origin of this world started with four emanations. The first one is creative force, an idea, a word, something creative, and the ancient Egyptians called it Heka. As a next step out of the creator, we need space and we need time. So what we have with the space is that earth and sky and air and humidity. Sometimes we struggle if tefnut is really humidity or maybe fire. So gap and nut, shu and tefnut are these first elements of space. The next one is that we have, and this is part of this world, it's part of um, uh, everything which is going on in this world, on one side, chaos, and on the other side, structure. Therefore, the god of wild nature, the god this, played an important role. And his opponent, the god of structure, of civilization, is Osiris. But what you can see here, and also before with Gap and Nut and Shu and Tefnut, you always have pairs. This means a male and a female part. When we have space, then this is not what um, all makes our world um, existing. There is more. We have cyclical time. Because as the people realized, not only that there was sky and earth, and that there was um, uh, the, the air and the humidity, they realized in the morning the sun god was coming up, and in the evening he disappeared. So this was a first step to an idea of cyclical time. The idea was that the solar god was 12 hours per day in this world and 12 hours in the other world. And so cyclical time existed. But of course, the people realized, although the sun god is coming back every day, the reality is a little bit different. And we have to see this in a moment. But what we have before we have the other world created, we have in this first step of the world a false emanation. And this is a multitude. This means living creatures, gods, and human beings. 
And these gods and human beings, they are living now in a space with a cyclical time. But if you look to reality, we need something else. And this is the afterworld because people are dying and they're not coming back like the solar world. So the next step is how the linear time was created. And for this, we need the assassination of Osiris by Zed. Death, or Zed, kills his brother Osiris. And therefore, Osiris has to be a god who suddenly needs another environment. And this environment could not be this world because he has been killed, he died. And was this Isis, the goddess of magic, she was able to work on the regeneration of Osiris. And to do this, she has to create the afterlife. So suddenly we have not only this world, we have the afterworld. And in the afterworld is a god Osiris. He is not coming back to this world. He is in the afterlife. Therefore, he stands for the linear time, while the god Reherachte, the solar god, is in this world and the afterlife. This means we have now a situation that we have two different worlds which are closely connected by the solar god. And after Osiris had to leave to the other world, we have a problem in this world because we need a um, king who is divine. And so his son, the god Horus, took on this role. So we have on one side, in this world, Horus, the son of Isis, and in the other world, Osiris. And Isis is linking both. Let's come to a last step. There is, and you may remember the question, what is after um, the uh, world has existed? Is there an end of uh, this life we are living here in this world? And therefore, the danger which is there also has been described. And this danger is in the afterlife, in the other world. In this world, we have the situation that the solar god, the god of the cyclical time, is also in the afterworld, where he has to meet the god Osiris so that the linear time can go on and the cyclical time also. Because if Osiris, the god of linear time, means a cyclical god of Re, the solar god, the solar god can renew himself. And therefore, the next morning is not the morning from yesterday. It's a new morning, although it's part of the cyclical time. And now what we are seeing in the night, there is a one dangerous moment. What we have here is a seventh hour of the night. In the seventh hour of the night, Apophis, the being, I will not say the god, of non-existing, is waiting. And he's waiting that the solar bark with the solar god is coming and that he can stop it. Because if the time is not continuing, because Apophis has stopped it, everything stops and this world will have an end. So what we have now is a situation that the god Re, the god of the solar time, has to work together with the god of the wild nature and of the power. This is the god of death. And together with the magic of Isis, they can accomplish that Apophis can't stop the existing of this world. Therefore, civilization and wild nature has to work together. But for this, you need ritual powers and knowledge and a kind of magic that both parts of the world can work together. Sounds very modern, sounds like a modern idea, something we are at the moment discussing intensively, how our world of the human beings and the world of the nature can work together without destroying each other. Now let's look a little bit more. What are these kind of theories and myths we have in different places? 
And I will start as an example with a question, how did being appear out of non-being? What you can see here is a god Toth. You saw him before. It's a guy with the Ibis head. So the idea was at the beginning, there was nothing. You may um, remember. If we are seeing that suddenly there are pattern and these pattern are sometimes um, uh, represented like tiny frogs and snakes. Um, and what we have here is a description of these different kinds of natures, different kinds of um, ideas, which are directly linked to the idea of non-being, non-existence. So we have a male and a female, noon and nounet, which means immobility. We have hech and hechet, infinity. We have kek and keket, darkness. And temenu and temenuit, veilessness. During the time, there are also some other sorts like amun and the maunet, hiddenness, or niau and niaut, empty space, or gerech and gereret, weakness. So this means the description, which suddenly creates structure, is just describing the non-being, the negative part of the create of the, the area, the time, the situation before creation. So, toss is then the singularity which comes out of these first structures in Hermopolis. And he is a God who creates in Hermopolis all the other aspects of this world. If we come to another place, Heliopolis, there is more the question not was before, what was before the creator? Um, what was before creation? Um, no, here the question is, who was the one who, who transformed into the many? We spoke about Atum. Here we see a representation of Atum. Um, from, um, it's a nice um, a statue made from bronze. And he is looking like a king. He has a double crown and he has um, as the different kinds of tools in his hands, which we know very well from representation of kings. He is so far the first divine being, but also the first king. Here we have his name, Atum. But then out of him, different kind of creations like the solar god appear. So it's part of him. And therefore you can see here, the singularity has inside of himself the solar aspect. And then we saw before um, on the other slide uh, that we have gap and nood, earth and sky, we have a shoe and tef nood, um, this is air and moisture or fire. Then we have Osiris, who later becomes the god of the other world, but here in this moment, he is still part of this world and uh, stands for civilization, his wife Isis, and this we talked uh, before about it, is the god of wild nature with um, his female partner. If we go to Memphis, this is a little bit um, south of Heliopolis, um, and uh, today uh, in the south of the modern um, city of Cairo, we have generally the same idea, only that the name of the creator is different. Here it is Tach, and out of Tach comes by his thoughts, the god Atum, the solar god, and then everything which you have seen before, earth and sky, um, and um, the air and the moisture, and Osiris and Isis, and this, and Memphis. So what only changed was the form and the name and the medium he used to create the world. Now we talked about Hekka. And Hekka uh, is a little bit difficult to explain. Many uh, Egyptologists are saying, oh, that's just magic. Um, but the term magic is for us a little bit a difficult term because um, it's uh, not really part of the standard um, uh, religions. So let's look what the ancient Egyptian tells us or some of the Egyptologists. Let's start at first with uh, a very famous Egyptologist, Bokuts, and he tries to explain what is magic in ancient Egypt. He's saying, according to ancient Egyptian conceptions, the belief that by acting out of a particular situation, a result will be triggered 
of by symbolic means in this world or in the uh, thereafter, hereafter due to an impersonal, morally neutral, mystical force which serves men as well as supernatural beings. So what means this? Magic is on one side a religious practice to effect or cause ritual power, and magic is not a form of sub-religion. It's an essential creative part. The purpose um, of Hacker is the possibility to cope with dangerous, unsolvable, and or irrational situations, to strive for success and power, and striving for successful ritual power. And uh, by the way, here you can see a representation of Hecker. The preconditions also have to be mentioned, and also this we find in ancient Egyptian text. It's persuasion that the material and immaterial aspect of the world are in, uh, intelligible, explicable, and that is very important, manipulatable. So this means human beings can manipulate not only the gods, but also what is going on in this world. The origin of magic, hacker, means it's an emanation, it's a, a hypothesis of the solar god and the first and most important creator source. Now we are looking what, on one side, the coffin text tell us about hacker. And here you can see Hacker, for example. Here he is represented as a human being and accompanying the solar god in the Book of the Gates. And here you can also see Hacker in the solar bark fighting and helping against Apophis, who is represented here, this dangerous being from out of creation as a snake with a lot of knives in his body so that he can't harm the solar bark. Now listen to the ancient Egyptians. In the coffin text, we can read, I'm the son of him who gave birth to the universe. I am the protection of that which the unique Lord has ordinated. I came to take my position that I received my dignity. The universe belonged to me before you gods, down with you who came after gods, because I am Hecker. So what suddenly Hacker is explaining, I was a first force. In later texts of the New Kingdom, we have the Book of the Dead. And here we can read, I'm one with a tomb, but he still flooded along in noon, the waters of chaos before any of his strengths had gone into creating the cosmos. I'm a tomb the potency and the potential of all that is to be. This is my magic protection, and it's older and greater than all the gods together. So what we learn here is that he is part of the creator god, part of the singularity. There are some other texts, and um, one is very important. It's also, again, uh, a coffin text. And this coffin text is the following. I am he whom the unique Lord made before duality had yet come into being. I am the son of him who gave birth to the universe. I am the protection of that the unique Lord has ordinated. I am he who gave life to the Ennead of the God. I have come to take my position that I might receive my dignity brought to me. This means we have here a very similar text we have seen before, and it's very important in all this text, doesn't matter if it's a pyramid text, if it is a coffin text, or the book of the cholesterol cow, or other books, it always wanted to make clear, Hacker is the first one. Now let's look how he is combined in images. Here we can see something we will talk about in a moment. This is the god of the heavens, the goddess of the heavens. And here we can see the god of the air. And he is lifting uh, the goddess of the heaven up from the god of the earth. But all this happened because directly beside um, everything which is going on there, Hecker, with his arms up, is observing it and giving it the force which is needed. 
Also, um, in another papyrus, a magical papyrus, we can see the god Osiris together with the god Maat behind him. The goddess Maat is the goddess of structure, of right, of the order in the world. And here we can see that besides the order in this world, also this magical power, this source is important. Both are standing behind Osiris, in front of him, we have other gods and adoration gesture. But what makes it very clear here from the early beginning, important is the structure of this world, is everything which is right, and on the other thing, everything which is powerful and full with the idea of creation like Hecker. The aspect of magic plays more and more an important role also in the first millennium BC. And we have different kinds of gods which represent this magic. It is not only Hecke inside of different gods like this deity, which we can see here. It's the god Bees who is linked to many other gods with a lot of fire symbols around him. And he is bringing all the power which is needed that our tomb, now here seen as a snake with arms and with legs, can create the world by lifting up the solar god here represented by a child. So if we come now to the question, how did space and time came into existence? Let's look again at space. And there are a lot of representations who show how important it is to unite the earth and the heaven, the sky. Um, this kind of close relation is very clearly stated here. By, uh, if you look at this papyrus from the British Museum in London, where you can see earth as a male god with erected phallus who wants to unite with the goddess of the heavens. But what you need is to lift her up so that after the unification, we have space. You can see this in different kinds of ways. Sometimes we have, like you can see this here, the two divine beings who are united. But if you look to another papyrus, which you can see here, then you can see we have even different kinds of gods and different aspects, a female one, one here with a snake head in addition, and then two male ones. And you can even see that this god is with his mouth grabbing his fellows. So the idea what you also have in the text that the gods out of himself can create the two gender and then the world comes into being. Very interesting is also that this moment, which is the beginning is linked to the end. And here you can see in the solar disk, not the child of the solar god. You can see the solar god as an old man because he is living through the 24 hours of the day from the juvenile god to the old god and will be reunited. If we are talking about the solar gods, then you can see here very well, again, the goddess of the heavens, Nut, Geb, the god of the earth. And then you can see here a god who is raising his hands, lifting up the heavens. And the text is telling us it's Shu, it's a god of the air. But he is very much linked here to the solar god because we have him here with a solar disk on his head. And then we can see on one side, the boat of the solar god is rising up to the heavens to um, the goddess Nut. And on the other side, um, in the evening hours, he is coming up to the other world. This is a kind of representation of the 12 hours of the night and the day, how the ancient Egyptians linked together in a very special motif, which for them very clearly states, this is space and cyclical time. In another combination of images in the tomb of Siti the first, King Siti the first in the Valley of the Kings, you can see um, the goddess of the heaven in the shape of a cow. And also here you have uh, the god Shu, the god of the air, who is lifting it up. 
And um, here we don't have a representation directly of the God of the earth. It's just a base, which you are seeing here, but the solar God is represented. You can see here a solar bark and the God raising up his hands and waiting that he can appear up to the heavens in the morning. Now let's look to the different representations of the solar god. From different kinds of papyri, we can see different kinds of motifs, particularly if it comes to the Amduat or other um, books which are dealing with um, the um, with the story um, of the solar god in this world and the other world. Um, the drawing, which you can see here, is very interesting. It shows the solar god as a child with a finger to its mouth, which is very typical for representations of children. And then you can see around this figure, we have uh, a snake which is biting in his own tail. This means this is a cyclical time because the god of the cyclical time is linked to this image of this um, snake, the serpent, which is biting itself and renewing itself any, every morning. And then you have two lions and the two lions, they are standing for the uh, mountains um, of the west and of the east um, of Egypt. They are the mountains where the solar um, god and the sun disk is appearing in the morning. But it also, and if you look down, um, uh, is appearing in the evening when the solar disk is going down and disappearing to the other world. And here you can see, again, the solar god here with a ram head and with a bended body, which shows us now it's the end of the day and the god becomes old. I just talked uh, to you about the danger of Apophis. And if we are now in the other world, um, then we can see in the afterlife that here the solar uh, god is in his boat um, uh, driving through the 12 hours of the night. And um, what you are seeing here is that in the seventh hour here, Apophis is waiting. We have gods and important texts which are telling us that the gods in the afterworld are really here helping the solar god to protect him so that Apophis can't stop his solar bark and that he continue the cyclical time. Now, this is an idea, this moment of the seventh hour, um, which gives us the idea that there might be an end of the universe, an end of everything which was created in this world. We just saw the representation that the powerful god Death, the god of chaos and world nature, is here um, destroying um, nearly Apophis. He has a spear in his hand and really helps that he can't harm the solar boat. And here we have the god with the solar boat and the sun disk um, on his head. Um, who is driving through the 12 hours. But there are also other representations like this. For example, in some tombs in Western Thebes and on some papyri, the solar god is suddenly represented as um, a, a cat, a wild cat. And you can see this wild cat uh, with a knife in his hand is destroying Apophis. And on the other uh, lower side, uh, you see an image and here we have the god Atum by himself, so the creator who stops um, directly at the border from this world to the other world, directly at the border between the world of nothing and the world of something, the snake, the serpent, the dangerous serpent of Apophis. Now, if we are asking how the afterlife was created, and we spoke about the god Osiris, who um, was leaving this world because he was killed by his brother Seth um, and becomes the lord of the afterlife. So this is a very important story, what we have to tell. And many people know the story of Isis and Osiris and the bad brother Seth. But we have to be very careful because this is not like a devil. This is the god of the wild nature. And therefore, of course, he is dangerous. 
for the civilization, like the sandstone, like um, all bad weather, which can create danger to the human beings, to this world, and therefore also to the gods. And uh, his um, function, of course, is to bring power to this world. And a good king um, is not only um, linked to Osiris, he is also linked to the solar god, he is also linked to this. And therefore, we have also names of kings. For example, Faz, the father of Ramses the Great, and his name was Zeti. And Zeti means he belongs to Zed because Zed is powerful. And Zed is part of this world. And you can see this here very well. If you are looking to this triad in the center of the slide, you have Osiris in the middle on the left side with the falcon head, his son Horus. And on the other side, uh, you see the god Death. Generally, he is the murder of Osiris. But here in this triad, which by the way is nearly life size, and you can visit it and see it today in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, you can understand it's a unit, a unit. It belongs to, together. And therefore, it's not only a bad criminal story, it's a story of creation and duration. And if you look here to the center uh, down side, this is a site of a throne of a very important king of the Middle Kingdom, Sir Wastrad I, uh, around 2000 BCE. And you can see the god Death together with the god Horus, with his falcon head, and they are knotting together the plants of Upper and Lower Egypt, and therefore stabilize the creation of Egypt, because the ancient Egyptians believed that Egypt is the center of the universe. If we are looking to this uh, papyrus, um, uh, and we saw um, it a little bit before, um, and I just want to show it again, um, to show that on one side you have different gods um, and different beings who are pulling here uh, through the uh, Nile of the um, underworld, the solar boat. But here again, you have the fight against Apophis in the seventh hour. To make very clear that this is dangerous, shows us this papyri on the left side from the Egyptian um, Museum in Cairo. You see in a shrine, we have in the upper part, uh, the figure of Osiris represented like the king. On the other side, upside down, you have the god Ness. He is kneeling and his arms are bent behind his back. So to make very clear in this papyrus that this must be there, he is important and powerful, but of course, always the structure and the king and Osiris must have the upper hand. So this means this world and everything which is powerful and good must be directed by the king. Interesting uh, is this kind of drawing which comes from a papyrus. And what you can see here, Horus and this become a unit. You have the head of Horus, Falcon, and you have this fabulous animal head of uh, Anubis. And um, it tells us that he has two heads. This is the inscription behind that. There's the two faces, which you can see. So you even can make a unit of both of the gods. And that this was worshiped particularly by important people uh, from the military, but also from some other administrative areas you can see here. This is a stele of a worshiper and he is raising his arms to this and hopes that with all his power, he will protect him. Last but not least, there are very different kinds of representations of this and how this can be controlled you just remember, we just saw before here that he was bound. But another version, how you can uh, arrange this is that you have here the god Horus with his falcon head and the upper image. And you can see this is now represented as a hippopotamus. And he is here um, with a string um, uh, in the hands of the god Horus. And if we go to the temple of Edfu, the Horus temple, then you can see the king, the living king, together with Horus, are really controlling um, the god 
um, Seth, who is very small, a very small hippopotamus, to make clear he must be there, but we have to control it. We, this is the royal power of the living king and of the divine king. Now let's uh, come to the next topic, and this is Osiris. Um, Osiris, uh, the god of the other world. We just talked about him, and here we can see him in his mummified form. Um, there are many, many papyrus. This Book of the Death, which are showing him, sometimes in a shrine, um, and uh, who is the judge of uh, the court of the death, where you can see that the feather of uh, the symbol of Ma'at and justice uh, is on one side, and the heart of the human being, here you can see him on the other side. This means he is not only the king, he is also the judge in the other world. And this combination of him, when at the end um, of the last hours um, in the night, the solar god unites with the sun god. This you can see here on this wonderful image, which shows Isis and Nephthys, the, um, the wife of Osiris and the wife of Set. And they are helping here the solar god, and you can see the ram head of the solar god, the sun disk, but he is on the body of Osiris, and the text telling us the solar god, it is the solar god who is satisfied in Osiris, and set, uh, Osiris is satisfied in the solar god. So a motif, an image which shows the combination of the solar god and the god of the other world, which is so important that I told you before, because it's essential that the cyclical time has to renew itself during the night in the combination with the linear time. And here you can see on the left side, Osiris with a green face, which stands for regeneration. And back to back, the god Atum, which makes very clear that the beginning of the creation and the continuation of the creation of the other world is protected by these two gods. That the solar god um, is um, continuously at the sky, we know, but what's happened after the death of Osiris, how he could resurrect himself. Here on this um, tiny statue, you can see, he is lying on his belly and starts to raise up his head because Isis with her magic power was helping with this. The two drawings you can see here on the right side also again, the god Horus is coming and he is touching his father and his father can get up from the bed of the death. And on the other side, you see something very interesting on the left upper side, there is the hieroglyph of the, uh, of the sky um, directly on top of this, the mummy of Osiris. And you can see it's growing out of his body um, some plants which shows the resurrection in the world and the resurrection of Osiris, that this resurrected Osiris can meet with the solar god and you can see uh, the solar disk with the arms to the right and the left and the solar rays, which are combined here with Osiris. There are many, many different kinds of versions how this is depicted in different kinds of book of the other world. Uh, and I only wanted to show this again, because here you can see very well uh, the connection of the lying Osiris as a mummy. He is linked to the sun disk in the um, uh, afterworld. And then you see in this world, after the resurrection, the solar god is represented as ram-headed with the solar disk on his head. And here at the end of a papyrus, um, and you saw this before, we see the old god, the old solar god, who is leaving here, um, this papyrus, because he wants to be renewed in the other world after he met with Osiris again here as a lying mummy. Very interesting is, uh, and very rare, uh, is a representation on a coffin, uh, which is today in uh, the museum in Hildesheim. What you can see here is how the dead 
person, the dead body, which is represented here in black, is at first cleaned by the priests. Then he is lying on a bed and you can see below his body, there is grain growing up, telling he can be um, resurrected and responsible for this um, as a priest, and here a priest with uh, an Anubis head, a falcon head, a god of the uh, embalming and mummification. And then after this ritual has been performed, you see the body mummified with the canopic jars with the inner origins below. And again, the god Anubis who is bending to the mummy and therefore the mummy can be resurrected, come back to life, but in the other world. This is something very, very rarely depicted because this is not the story of Osiris, it's a story of the person who is buried in this coffin. There are many, many different kinds of books in the um, tombs, particularly the tombs of the kings in the Valley of the Kings. Here, for example, in the tomb of Ramesses V. And what you can see is a whole story of the solar god. You can see a face to the left um, of the solar goddess and then the red tiny um, um, ball of the solar disk through the different hours in the night. And then you can see on the other side, um, a second body without it, only the stars. And the boats uh, of the solar god from hour to hour move forward. Here, this shows us the book of the day and the book of the night. So what happened during the day in the upper part and what's happened during the night in the lower part. Um, this description is so essential because it helps to recreate, to reform the world every night. And this is so important that the people and also the king can survive in the afterlife. And here you can see uh, on the, in the book of the earth, um, the solar god in his bark, but very interesting, if you look to the center, you see a nude figure with the erected phallus. And what we have here is a resurrection of the god Osiris after he met the solar god. Now let's come to one of the last questions. How did God's men and kingship came into being? What we can say is that at the very beginning, there is an idea of kingship. The king is in the same time, a God. What you can see here is a statue of um, a very, very famous king. It's Hafra. And King Hafra, the life-size statue is today in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, is shown here as the god and the king itself. This very close combination of kingship to the, um, to the idea of this world and the other world, you can see here very well. We have on one side, the king of the gods, the solar god, for example, who was at the early beginning the time of the pyramids, the most important god, and he was a king. Then you have Osiris here in the center, who was for a while a king in this world after his death became the king of the other world. So kingship is in this world and the other world essential. And this comes together in the new kingdom with the god Amun, who is the king of the gods and therefore the king of the heavens. So we have a king in this world, we have a king in the other world, and we have the king in the heavens. This all melted together in the Ptolemaic period. And here you look to a god who looks not really very Egyptian. Uh, generally, his shape looks Hellenistic. And uh, this is a background. The Ptolemies um, were, of course, kings which are coming from Macedonia and uh, from the Greek area. But to create a god, and to be a god who is in this world and in the other world um, and in the heavens, one god with different aspects. This was put together in the Hellenistic time with the god Serapis. If you just look to this um, uh, schedule, uh, to, to this um, form, then you can see how this all developed. 
if you come from the old kingdom to the Ptolemaic period, then you can see the king in the heavens, the king in this world, the king in the netherworld, um, this is divine. And then it was suddenly separated. In the time of Rafra, after Khufu, the king who built the biggest pyramid, we have the idea that the solar god is the father of the kings. And at the end of the old kingdom, we have it split up the god Ra, the solar god in the heavens, the king in this world, and the god Osiris in the other world. If we look down, for example, to the middle kingdom, then we can see the Amun aspect started to play a role. You have seen this before, there's a representation of Amun. And very short, we have an interruption, we come to this in a second, with the god Aton, who combines all of this. But then, and we just saw Zarapis, to combine again the heavenly god, the king, and Osiris and Zerapis in the netherworld. This is something which was the idea to rebuild this unique idea that the king is divine and the king is also a living person. I just said we have one exception. Over nearly 3,000 years, there was not so much change in the system. The stories were told a little bit different, but the concept was the same. This was a little bit different when we have Aratnatan and Nefertiti. The solar god you can see here, it's a sun disk. We are talking sometimes about that this is the basis for monotheism. This is not really true. It's some Egyptologists, particular one called Asman is saying henotheism. This means there is a strong focus on this one solar god, not represented here uh, under Echnaton or the Achetnaten at Nefertiti um, as a falcon-headed god, just as a solar disk. What we have here, and you can see them here with their children, the daughters, is the idea that we have a focus on one God, and it's the first time in Egypt, and also this doesn't happen later, um, until the end of the um, time, the Ptolemaic time, that under Aratnaton, another God was not accepted anymore. There was a fight against Amun and the fight for Aton. This was not working very well because directly after the death of Aratnaton and Nefertiti, under Tut and Amun, who was at first, had at first the name Tut and Aton, living image of Aton. And after this first years, the priests say, this is not working anymore. And the name was changed in living image of Amun, as you all know it, Tut and Amun. Um, there, the old concept has changed again to the back. So what are the most important functions of a king? Number one, the king has to give um, different kinds of offerings to the gods. He is a main communicator to the gods. He is a god by himself, but he is representing the human beings and is communicating to the gods. He in this world, and you can see this on this ostracon here, um, is smiting the enemies so that order can be established again and again and continue. And then, this is very interesting, you see here the representation of a king, and he has a tiny figure on his head with a, a tiny feather on top of the head. This is Ma'at. So he is guarant uh, giving the guarantee to all the human beings, but also to the gods, that order and justice and the continuation of this world will continue. This is the main function of the king. And therefore, kingship is very essential for ancient Egypt because it links divinity and royalty to the human beings and the other gods. You can see this here very well, um, also on the stela, which is today in Hildesheim. What you can see here are the different levels. This is Ramses II, the king, and he is again holding the tiny Ma'at figure, this representation of order and justice to the god 
Tach, you have met before, the creator God of Memphis. So he is telling the God on the divine level, I take care for the order in the world. Then he turns around. He is now in his palace and he is um, uh, throwing down honorary gold to a gentleman. You only can see his legs here. It's the owner of the stele, a Mr. Mosser. So now he is communicating to um, uh, the people in um, his army, to the people uh, in the administration who just should do everything what he is ordering him. But they receive something from him. If they are doing a good job, they get honorary gold. Then in the lower level, you can see uh, the representation of a colossal statue, which originally was placed in front of a temple in the Ramses city, by the way, where my museum is excavating since 40 years. And then you can see the smaller figure of the king. He is standing beside his own colossal figure, is throwing down honorary gold to Mr. Mosse. And then a little bit later, there was added a lot of people. You can see them in the lower corner to the right. These are the people, the soldiers, um, the army of Mr. Mosse, and also they get some honorary gold. They get um, this kind of special benefits from the king because they have done a good job. Let's nearly come to the end. If we are looking what was all going on um, in ancient Egyptian religion, what you can see at the beginning was that we have different stories in different areas which are describing the same structural idea of the origin and the stabilization of our universe. In the time of the, let's say, second half of the first millennium BCE, more and more these gods became one goddess. They um, are linked to one another. And here you can see, for example, uh, two examples of such pantheistic deities. We see, for example, the ram head and the shekel head, or here the head of the god Bees, linked with a lot of different elements to make clear here all the divine elements are put together to one goddess or to one god. And the best example for this is the goddess Isis. Because in the Greco Roman period, she could link to all the other goddesses in the Greek world. So um, she is linked in Egypt to the goddess Hathor, to the goddess Mu, to the goddess, um, for example, uh, of the primeval flood. And here you can see in red, she also can be combined with all the Greek gods. If you look for all the functions she had, a lot of functions which before other goddesses had, like um, divine domination, being a divine mother, um, taking care for the life and the death, goddess of love, of vegetation, of primeval um, flood. She is related to the moon, to health, to uh, protection, uh, to fate, to justice and order, to the protection and to fight. So you can see a lot of gods are here involved. And the same we had with the god Serapis we met before. What the Egyptians tried in this time was linking uh, the Hellenistic and the Egyptian um, uh, names of the gods and the functions to one unique god who puts us all together in a pantheistic way. So for the Serapis, we have eternity, divine kingship, solar ideas, the underworld, the power of the nature, protection and healing, magic protection. And here we see the many, 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 we must say thousands of gods of, gods of ancient Egypt. They were coming together with all their different names and were linked to one God. It is not the time of poor monotheism. This starts later. This is with Judaism, this is with Christianity and with um, the uh, Islam. Because in this time, what we have here, the pantheism, we have all the other gods are still existing, but they are linked together to one figure, to one overall god or goddess.
I think I talked a lot about ancient Egyptian creation and creation myths. I hope I have inspired you to look a little bit more into the exhibition, um, which we have done to go, together with our friends from Salt Lake City. We have here a tiny stela. You can see a gentleman to the light, right with um, the arms or, um, up in adoration. You see the two big ears, and I hope that you were listening well, and I hope that you are continuing your interest in ancient Egyptian religion, in ancient Egyptian culture, and ancient Egyptian art. Thank you very much, and goodbye.